Right, I shall start. Hey, good evening, people. Uh, welcome to Women Who Code Singapore event. Today, um, we have an amazing speaker joining us. But before that, let me introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Stella. Uh, I'm currently actually a senior cloud native architect at VMware. So um, today, this event will be about um, joy, uh, about talking about the resilient, uh, making a resilient real-time data streaming with Kafka and about a few of the real world use cases where this um, streaming, data streamings can be leveraged on. So before I start and passing this over to our amazing speaker, let me introduce a little bit about Women Who Code. So just wanna share a little bit about our mission. Um, our mission is actually to empower diverse women to excel in technology careers with the vision of ensuring this diverse woman who is actually historically excluded can thrive at every level. So there are four core values which we um, hold dearly. Uh, we focus on our mission. We design for um, inclusion. We advocate for change. And we always ensure that there's always journey forward. We charge, we celebrate, and we break barriers. So without further ado, let's just talk a little bit about our cash. Our cash is our amazing uh, speaker today. She is an engineering leader at Confluence. She's as well an international trainer, a career coach, and an author sorry, an author. And she has one and a half decade of experience in big data, uh, machine learning and distributed streaming architecture. She is a sought after trainer who has conducted various trainings and workshop on a range of topics. So today I'm really, really excited with the topic that she's gonna share with us today. So Phil, do um, have questions and type it up on the Google, uh, sorry, on the Zoom chat, and then we will go through them. And at the end of the session, there will be a feedback form. So uh, help us as well to fill it up so that we know uh, what kind of improvement that we need to have in the next upcoming workshops and sessions as well. So I guess I shall pass the presentation over to you. Oops, sorry. Let's stop sharing. Sorry, Akesh, I don't think I can hear you though. But I think oh, others no. yeah. were able to. Uh, no, no. So no, what, just what just happened? What just happened? What just happened? Was oh. this a network glitch? Maybe not. It was intense. What's it? What we are having right now? Mm hmm is an example of a real-time streaming use case and that is what i was trying to display so this was all scripted ah. you guys can hear me there is no network problem but do you know what is it that's actually sending these information at real time these are the real-time streaming pipelines which have been set up which are lined behind this entire zoom facade which are actually powering this conversation and this meeting right now. So who all here has, if has say more than 10 apps on their phones, please raise your Zoom hand. So I'm looking for Zoom hands for whoever has 10 apps, more than 10 apps on their phones. Yeah, I see a lot of hands which are raised. Now, do you all know that out of their, these 10 apps, there is a, 90% personality possibility that Kafka is the architecture which is actually powering these apps. So this is how I want to start my discussion today. It is not only a, a presentation based this kind of, uh, talk we are going to have. We are going to have a lot of in-depth topics which would be covered. Okay. And let's get started to learn more about Kafka and how the real-time streaming pipelines and data structures are created. So everyone is able to see my screen from yeses. Are you guys able to see my screen? Um, no. Oh. No, okay, give me a moment. Let's try this. Yes. Good now? Yeah. Okay. Okay, then let's get started. So, um, first of all, 
welcome to everyone here. This discussion that we are going to have, this is on behalf of Confluence Developer Outreach Efforts. Uh, Confluent is the 90% contributor to Kafka. Uh, we actually started from Kafka itself. The, one, the current CEO was the one who was actually working in Kafka at LinkedIn. Then these guys, they picked up on Kafka. They had a vision of converting Kafka into a cloud-based project. And hence, that is the vision that is driving Confluent today. As I said, 90% of the contributions to the open source Kafka are powered through Confluent itself. Okay. And before we start today's discussion, what I want to understand is how many of us have worked on Kafka for say more than a year. So raise of hands, zoom hands, I want to understand who all here has worked on Kafka. So I see one hand, I see Stella has worked on Kafka. Do we have anyone else who has worked on Kafka here? Okay. So Stella, you're going to help me out today. If there are any questions from the audience, I'm going to pass them on to you. Yeah, so this is how it's going to work today. So all my Kafka experts here. So does it mean that the rest of the guys uh, help you? Do you have any use cases in your, uh, in your work which have uh, brought you here in the Kafka workshop? Anyone who's currently, or he who, who's going to work on Kafka, or has had some slight introduction to Kafka earlier. Can you raise your hands? Okay. Okay, I see Saloni as well. Good, good. Okay, let's get started now. So, uh, thank you, Stella, for the wonderful introduction already. I'm an engineering leader at Confluent. I have one and a half decades of work experience working in cloud ML and AI platforms. Uh, at Confluent, I handle the billing and monetization team. And uh, I'm an author. One of my book series has already been published. It's there on the table. And I'm the founder of an organization called Career Reengineering outside of my office work. Okay, let's get started. So what we'll do is we'll have a quick recap of Kafka basics. So this is how an entire Kafka ecosystem looks like. So we have Kafka in the center, which is powering the Kafka producers and the Kafka consumers. So what happens is that when we look at producer, a Kafka producer is a typical application. It could be mobile-based, it could be uh, IoT devices, it could be desktop applications, which are sending any sort of events and data into Kafka. And then we have Kafka consumers. So what are Kafka consumers? So whatever data lies in Kafka, these applications read from Kafka and then publish it to somewhere else or they do their own processing and then save it to something else. Then we also have sources which are pushing data into Kafka through connect clusters. Uh, we would, uh, in the discussion itself, we'd go through Kafka Connect as well and we would understand what are sync and source connectors. Meanwhile, this is how at a very high level, the entire Kafka ecosystem looks like. So most of the use cases in the industry involve writing into Kafka and reading from Kafka. That's where Kafka becomes the center hub of data. Now, when it comes to Kafka, we talk about events. What are events? Events are nothing but any information or a trigger which would then further initiate a sequence of events. So uh, in general, an event has a key and a value. So for example, if it could be a user ID and as the key and the value could be everything information related to a value. Okay. Now coming to Kafka topics, whenever we have, so Kafka topic is more of a container. Okay. Uh, we can probably look at it as a log of events rather than a queue of events. So for example, if I were to implement a system wherein I am pushing some information or some events which some other application has to read, then the first thing that comes to my mind is that I would have all of these events written into a queue. Okay. And then there would be a separate container, a separate application, which would be reading data from this queue. Right. Now, if I were to implement this queue, what, what data structure can I use to implement the queue? Anyone here? Please write into the chat. I'm looking at the chat to see your answers. 
what is the data structure that we can use to implement a queue? Link list, tags, queues, JSON or a dictionary that could help for a lookup, but how would you maintain the sequence? So in JSON, you can't maintain a sequence, right? In a dictionary, it's only a indexed lookup. So if you have to implement a queue, you can use yes, either a linked list or you can use stacks, correct? Now that's where, now the challenge with having a queue is that if you have one consumer who's reading from this queue and that consumer has already picked up an event from the queue, then it's removed from the queue, right? Because it is which? Uh, first in, first out, correct? So when it is already removed from the queue, then in that case, if there is another consumer which also wants to read from the queue, they would not be able to find that data. That's how Kafka topics are differently implemented or rather written as compared to a queue. So when we talk about topic, topic is not a queue, topic is a log of events. What do we mean by log of events? Imagine that you are writing all of these events to a file. Okay. So essentially, topics are persisted as well. What it means is that when the, these Kafka topics are created, there is the file system wherein all of this information is written into. Because as we said, Kafka topics are files, correct? And files need to be persisted somewhere. So in general, they are persisted on your desk itself. So for example, if I go ahead and create a Kafka cluster on my laptop itself, then there would be a uh, place where a disk repository where I'd be uh, storing all of the Kafka topics which are created, okay? So this means all the data that is written into Kafka is persistent, okay? So it's not you know, staying in the memory, it is also on the disk for capturing again, okay? Then another important aspect about Kafka topics are that these are append only. Now, can someone tell me why it does it have to be append only? Any guesses? Why is it that fast? Yes, good. Can you speak up as to what do you mean by fast? I'm adjusting my screen to be able to see your comments. Kela, do we have, uh, do the participants have permission to unmute themselves? Yes, they do. Yeah. Okay. So one answer that I have received is fast. Do you want to share why do you think it will be faster? Okay, uh, let me help there. So since all of this data is written to onto a file, okay? And the way files write is that there is a disk writer which finds, which seeks the position at the disk Essentially, all the files are written onto a disk, correct? Right? In your laptops, in your servers, there are disks. So when the data has to be written, it is fastest if the seek place is the seek time can be reduced, okay? So if the data is written in a sequence, okay, at consecutive addresses, then in that case, the disk does not have to move a lot and it can start writing there itself. So all of the data which is written into Kafka is append only as compared to uh, say a linked list, linked list which would be uh, which would be a um, sparse location where the data would be written okay which would be indexed random randomly written data okay so another now moving on to the next thing since this is all written into a file which is append only this data can only be uh, is, uh, ex uh, gotten received rather through a offset. All of this data is written into a file, so it is not indexed, right? So we can't say that array one give me that data, right? We can't. We wouldn't be able to say that for a data which is written into a file. So what do we need? We need offset. That inside this file at this position is the data that I want to read from. Okay. So all of the data which is written into Kafka topics is one persisted as a file in the system. Two, it is append only for fastest retrieval. Then third, it is it can only be uh, uh, received or retrieved through the offset, okay? 
and the events which are written into the log files they are all immutable why immutable because we don't want that any of the producer or the consumer have the rights or permissions to mutate the data or make the data dirty so essentially as a log system kafka can stay in between and whatever events are getting written okay the producers and the consumers they are, can run they can run independently of each other and the data is never corrupted okay then now coming to the data can we always keep writing to the file the of course if the data increases over the period of time the disk would not be able to store this much amount of data so what do we have we have retention periods there okay now uh, we have retention period as well as compaction so the data which is written into kafka topic we can compact it as well so now let's look at how we can compact it so the data the retention now coming to retention the by default retention period of events in a kafka topic is 7 days what it means is that if there is a event which was written say 7 days back then that data will get automatically deleted okay now let's look at it here so uh, with the new events you see they are all blue but the ones which are older events they are ready to be deleted okay now what is the segment which is written here so when we write kafka uh, when we write uh, data on two topics these are files separate files which are written now if we keep writing to one single file itself what happens is that the file grows really big okay so what would you uh, so essentially if we ever have to delete a, a data we can't of course delete half of the file right if some if we have to delete a file we can run a rf minus rf command on the file correct but can we ever do this that uh, have if i give you a interview question that uh, you have a file okay you have a 1 mb file and i want you to remove half of the file is that possible yes or no in the chat can we delete half of the file so if half of the data was more than 7 days old would we have permission to actually only delete the data which was earlier which was older than 7 days if it was all in the same file yes or no no correct so we can't remove half of the file so what have we implemented to battle that what we have done is that as part of the kafka topic the kafka topic does not get written in a long file itself what we rather do is that we have segments so a small file will have f1 underscore 0 f1 underscore 1 f1 underscore 2 likewise okay what it helps is that these smaller segments they are easy to be deleted so these smaller segments are separate files so you see here in one single topic we have 1 2 3 4 right and then the active log segment is where the latest data gets written to and the older log segments can are ready to be deleted okay now there is one question that i want to ask the audience from this slide so you see the second log segment to the left right there are some events here which are clearly older than 7 days for example the event with key 50 and 57 they are older than 7 days but they are not marked for deletion can someone tell me why so let me repeat my is question is it because hmm it is because the uh, some portion of the log segment is still within 7 days absolutely correct as we discussed these are the logs which get uh, which get deleted these segments are the ones which are ready to be deleted but it means that not half of the events but rather all of the events whenever they are ready or rather older than 7 days that's only a this entire segment will be ready to be deleted okay so it's not that when someone comes and says that the retention period was 7 days and this event this has happened to uh, uh, us also in one of the project that we were there was a event which was older than 7 days but we could still see it in our topic now the reason for that is that the segment on which this particular older event was written 
that segment had some latest data also, which was not yet older than seven days. And hence, this entire segment was not yet ready to be deleted. And if this segment is not deleted, this means it will still appear on your Kafka topics. Okay, and this actually becomes a good interview question as well. Okay, now coming to compaction. Now there are certain scenarios wherein you would want to have a longer retention period. But what happens with a longer retention period is that the longer retention you have, it starts taking more space also on the disk. The topic would become huge. And then there are certain use cases wherein you would, you are, we are only interested in getting the latest state of a particular event. So for example, if I talk about an order, now say uh, the order has multiple states, correct? So the order was created, the order is uh, ready to be fulfilled, it is dispatched, it is delivered, or it has, the delivery has, uh, was attempted, it has succeeded or failed, and then returned, right? So there are multiple stages. Can I look at the question for a moment? Is this the computing or storage layer? If retention period should be different between the two. No. So in Kafka, Kafka, when we talk about Kafka, we have talked about Kafka being a log retention, right? So because it is logs, of course, it is only storage, right? Now, when it comes to computation, there are other parts in the ecosystem which do the computation. For example, computation is done through Kafka streams, K SQL DB. The Kafka producers, the Kafka consumers, those are the ones which do computations. But when it comes to Kafka, Kafka only does one job. And that is events get written to it. It persists those events. Okay. It provides HA, it provides resiliency, resiliency, it provides fault tolerance. That's all Kafka does. If we only talk about Kafka. Did I answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Going back to compaction. Now, we were talking about orders. Orders keep changing their state. So for most of the generic use cases, when it comes to order, you would only want to look at the current state of the order. Correct? So for example, what are the total number of orders which are still stuck in the fulfillment phase? Or what are the orders which are right now going out for delivery? Right? These are the generic use cases that we have to handle. Now, when it comes to these or uh, type of use cases, we are only interested in the latest status of the event. So if we are not only interested in the earliest uh, states of those events, what do we do? How can we actually make a uh, compact our entire topic? That's where the topic compaction policy comes into picture. What it does is it looks at the entire Kafka topic and based on the key, it checks if there were earlier instances also of the same event okay and what it will do is it will retain the latest event the updated event and delete the earlier event so here in the slide if you look at we have 94 heli which is the latest event so if you look here 74 key 74 and 71 61 and 29 these were earlier states of the same Ellie uh, order account. Yeah. And these all events are ready to be deleted. Why? Because they were older. We are not interested in keeping them. Okay. One good question here could be how is it decided that which is the latest event? Okay. Now, can anyone answer that? How do we basically understand what is the latest event to a particular key? Anyone? Timestamp, correct. So whenever an event is written into Kafka, we write key, we write the value. But inside every event, there is timestamp also, event timestamp, which is also written inside every event. Okay, that is written, uh, that gets written by the producers in place. Okay, so based, that, based on that event timestamp is how Kafka retention policies decide if that event is older than seven days or if this same event 
has repeated earlier also and later as well. So whatever are the earlier timestamps would get deleted. Okay. Moving on to an interesting concept of partitioning. Now, when it comes to Kafka, so imagine that I gave you an interview question that you have to write a file. Okay. And you're, you're writing this file on say a server S1. Okay. Now there are some users which are reading these files. Now, what happens if the server S1 goes down? What would happen? Nobody will be able to access this file at all. Correct. Now say you want to provide a fault tolerance. So what would you do? To determine the, there is a question before you move on. How does KSQL determine the correct timestamp? Again, KSQL uses Kafka. Okay. And every event that KSQL uses has a timestamp already written onto it. Okay. So whatever KSQL is actually an abstract on top of the Kafka itself, which means that it has access to the events. Is your question answered? We move on. Okay. Uh, if you have more doubts, feel free to write it. Moving on to partition. So my question to you was that if I ask you that I, um, as a part of interview question, I'm asking you that you have to write a file and you, have, you are only writing it to one server. If we have to increase for, uh, fault tolerance, then in that case, what would we do? So what would we do? We would basically start breaking the file and writing it onto multiple servers as well. How that would help is that if I'm, if I have three different, say, let's call them partitions, these three different files, let's call them partitions on three different servers, S1, S2, S3. Okay. Now there could be multiple producers now who can write onto it. So this means that faster writes, correct. And then if there are consumers, which are reading from it, there, instead of one consumer reading from one file, there are, there could be multiple consumers reading from each of these partitions, right? So there are faster reads as well. This is the same fundamental which Kafka topics have also implemented. So when we write data to a Kafka topic in a file itself, these files are actually split across partitions. Okay. Now what happens is that where are these partitions hosted? They are hosted all on brokers. So when we talk about a Kafka cluster, a basic starting level Kafka cluster involves three minimum of three uh, brokers. Okay. Now say there were three partitions we had created of this topic. So partition zero, partition one, and partition two. Okay. Uh, rather partition we have more as well here. Okay. So all of these partition actually get distributed across the Kafka brokers. So even if say broker, uh, the middle broker goes down only one part of the partition, the partition one would go down. The others will still be intact. Okay. So if we are hosting an application, it would mean that it's not that the complete set of users, uh, have uh, the data complete set of users is down, it would not happen. At least we would still be serving to other users which are not sitting on the middle broker. Okay. Now, uh, when it comes to partition, the data is distributed. And how is it distributed? It is by default, it is distributed through the cache partitioner. So when the producer is writing data into these partitions, Imagine that this is a this is a very simple modular function that we have implemented. Okay, so all the keys on the left side, you see these are the events which are coming in one to three till six, and there's a modular function of three y three because there are three partitions. Okay, now this is the modular function. These keys are inserted into multiple different partitions. So we see if there is a key one. It, will, it is always going to partition one. Okay. Now later, what this means is through this partitional logic, we can always say that Kafka guarantees order at partition level. Okay. What it means is that say you are getting events one by one. Okay. So whatever uh, events are getting written into your Kafka partition, you see, they would always be written in that order. So in case if a user has uh, a consumer, there is a consumer application which has a use case wherein uh, you would want to read these data in sequence. Then in that case, 
the uh, guarantee of sequence is provided at partition level in Kafka. Okay. Now moving on to brokers. So brokers are the machines which actually participate in creating a Kafka cluster. So here you see we have a three broker machine to create a basic Kafka cluster. And then we have separate producers, uh, separate producers which are writing into Kafka. And then we have separate set of consumers which are reading from Kafka. Okay. Then these brokers are the ones which handle, which manage the data part in terms of uh, where the data is stored, the partitions, the replications, etc. Also, the the read and write up from the producers and consumers is also handled through Kafka itself. Okay. Now coming to replication. Now, uh, what we want to so. If we, uh, if I give you an interview question that say you, you have created a file, you have ensured that you are able to delete the file also and handle retention because you have created segments, then you have actually handled the writes as well, the reads, higher reads as well through partitions. But what happened when the broker, the middle broker went down, that data got away, right? You, we lost that data. Now, to ensure that we don't even lose on to that data and we have higher availability HA, but how do we handle that? That is handled through replication. But replication means is that every partition that we saw, it would have multiple copies of the same data. And this data is then uploaded or rather it is stored in other brokers. So where, when we saw, uh, so this is how a typical replication looks like. Okay, there is a question we have. How does this partition help if one server failure will each partition have the copy of data? Okay, so we are actually going through the same concept right now. Uh, let's see if the question gets answered uh, implicitly itself. So we talked about partitions, they were stored on multiple servers. But if any of those servers went down, we can say 100% of the data was not lost, but at least the data which was sitting on that one particular broker was lost. Now, how do we handle such situations? Through replication. So every partition that we created, we create multiple copies of those partitions, okay? The first, the primary partition becomes the leader and the other replicas, they are, they are called replica partitions itself. So here they are represented through red and blue. So for example, let's talk about partition zero. So partition zero was sitting on broker one. Okay, we created multiple copies and we stored them on broker two and broker three also. Okay, so say now in this current situation, if broker two goes down, broker two is essentially a machine, right? Say if broker two goes down, would we lose on uh, lose on to any data? No, right? Because say if partition one is the main primary partition which was stored here, partition even if broker two goes down we would still have the replicas of partition one on broker one and broker three as well, okay? So we can, we'll be able to bring up our applications from these partitions, okay? Did I answer your question? Okay, I'll continue. Yeah, thank you. Okay, now this is interesting. Um, who all here has worked on, um, say, SQL DBs, RDBMS? They also have HA, right? Yes? A raise of hands. Yeah. Okay. Now, the difference between the way RDBMS in, uh, implement HA and the way Kafka implements HA here is that when it comes to RDBMS, we have the concept of master sleeve. Okay, what happens is that the writes happen on the master, and to have faster reads, the reads happen from the slave. Okay, so this way is the writes and the reads, they are separated and independent. Now, here is my question: what is what is the problem here if the reads happen from the follower or rather let's say the uh, slave what what is the possible challenge that can happen either the uh, unmute yourself and share or probably you can write on the chat as well 
Anyone? So raise of hands who here have uh, heard of or learnt about this cap theorem. Cap theorem? Yes? Okay. So now cap theorem says that at any time when a partition uh, fault happens, you can either have consistency or you can have availability. By availability, we mean we mean that whenever there is a read or write request, the request should get handled and respected. By consistency, we mean that if there is a partition fault, then in that case, the system can decide either it would let it write or not let it write at all. So either the data would get written completely and persisted, or the data would not get written at all, okay? So when it comes to the RDBMS systems, okay, because they have ensured that if somebody is writing data, say there is a master, there is a slave, and they both get disconnected. Okay, there is a network fault and they both get disconnected. But still, the writers would still be able to write data to the master, and the readers would still be able to read the data from the slave. But the challenge here would be there is there would be a break in consistency. How? So say there is a, a row here, okay? Say the row ID is one, and the there are some consumers which are reading that particular row from the slave. But then in the master itself, that row has gotten updated. So say that the amount, uh, say this was a user account, okay? And the amount in that account has gotten updated. That update would not be received in the slave because there's a partition fault which has happened. Okay, so this is where the RDBMS systems, they don't provide you consistency. Okay, but when it comes to Kafka, because Kafka has to handle, it has to be the brain when it comes to the data and events in an entire ecosystem. We have to ensure that the data is always consistent. So whatever data gets written into Kafka, all the readers or consumers are always reading the same data copy itself. Okay, so that's the reason why in Kafka, all the reads and writes always happen through the leader itself. Okay, now when it comes to, uh, now all the reads and writes are happening onto the leader itself. So then how is it that your client ensures that the writes have happened properly, right? So when a client writes into Kafka, what it does is the, it waits for something called an acknowledgement, okay? Now, this acknowledgement could be of multiple different, oh, okay. So we'll cover that during uh, producers itself. So for now, what we have learned is the reads and writes will always happen through leaders. And if the leader fails, then in that case, the reads and writes will start happening to the followers. Now, quickly jumping on to producers. Now, what are producers? Producers are those applications which are writing data onto Kafka. Okay, so these are any these are the client applications which are interacting with Kafka through the broker information. So all what we provide is what is the broker ID, the broker IDs, what are the Kafka IPs, and what are the topic that this producer needs to write to, and how do you want the rights to be acknowledged? Okay, so these are the kind of concepts that we'll quickly look at. Now, producer acknowledgement. When producer has to write data to Kafka, how is it that we can ensure that my data has written got has gotten written properly? So that's that happens through producer acknowledgement. Now, when a producer uh, producer writes data into Kafka and say if this is a requirement where they are okay with data loss, they are okay with fire and forget kind of situation, then we set the act as zero. Okay. So do you think that there are any use cases where a producer would be okay with, say, missing out on some data? Are there any uh, use cases that you guys can think of? Unmute yourself. Okay. So for example, right now as we are talking, what is more important that my voice reaches you first, correct? It's okay if some bytes of the data gets dropped. Correct? So this, while we are having this kind of a streaming of voice and audio, these are one type of use case wherein 
we are okay with the specific data drop as well okay so for example if there is a producer application which is right now sending all of this audio to a different cluster now if it's not able to send say it was sending an event but because of some reason the event got dropped when it was getting written to a topic and it's okay one or two bytes here and there that's okay right so that but what we are gaining here is that we are basically able to get higher speed and lower latency okay as a producer if you have a use case wherein you don't care about data loss but you want to have speed that's where you'd go for acloop equal to zero okay now say you uh, you want speed you want lower latency but you don't want that you have no uh, clarity on if or the, not the data was written then in that case we set act equal to 1 at the producer so what happens is that when the producer has written data to the kafka topic and because the data would always get written to the leader the leader would send an acknowledgement back that yes i have received the data okay and that happens implicitly we don't do it programmatically it's already inside kafka okay so the producer would basically get to understand that at least my data has gotten written to the leader okay and that serves well in most of the use cases but say there is a situation so the producer wrote data to the leader the leader received the data sent an acknowledgement back to the producer and the producer thinks that the data is written properly but at the same instant say the acts got sent the act got sent back to producer but the broker one where the leader was there it went down then in that case what would happen even before the leader could replicate the data to the followers the broker went down okay so th there could be situations of data loss but then we have several use cases wherein we can't survive even a single data loss right so for example if it is a transactional data you are doing a, a debit from a particular account right you would not want that a single data gets or even gets dropped right so for these kind of situations we set act equal to either minus 1 or all what it means is that whenever there is a producer which is writing data onto a leader it would actually wait for the leader to replicate the data across the followers as well okay so this way the leader ensures that whatever event was written onto the leader has gotten replicated and then only it sends the act back to the producer okay so this way we get 100% guarantee that when a producer has sent an event it is always and always persisted into kafka okay now how to create a producer very simple we basically had kafka has exposed uh, libraries and all of the uh, in nitty gritties of kafka producers are actually imbibed abstracted into the kafka producer okay okay so we create a kafka producer object we given what is the topic name that we, the producer wants to write to what are the brokers that uh, the producer needs to connect to all of this is uh, imbibed inside the properties properties file and when it comes to writing the record we create an object of producer record this is a basic java implementation we create a producer report uh, record and that's where we set in the topic that we need to write to the key and value of the event okay so the key would help decide which partition of this output topic the data needs to be written to okay coming to consumers quickly now when the data is written into kafka how is it that consumers read from kafka so these consumers they they subscribe to the topics which are there in kafka and within the topics they read this data as an up and only fashion so they pull the data from kafka topic and then work on the data do the uh, computations and then send either a commit back okay now when it comes to kafka topics and uh, the consumers consumers have a notion of consumer group now how does this help we looked at that a kafka topic can have multiple partitions okay now say this is the early stage of an application that you are developing as part of your project you only have one instance of your consumer 
Okay, so there is only one single say Kubernetes pod which is hosting your consumer application. So it will be reading the entire set of topics. Okay, now say tomorrow the load has increased and you want to inst uh, have more instances of your consumer. Okay, so what would happen is that when you create when we create consumers, what we do is we set up a property as to consumer group name. Okay, and then whichever new instances that get spawned up they go back and register themselves as part of that consumer group okay and then all of these consumer groups they basically talk to each other and figure out how would they distribute and that's where a group leader comes in so whichever consumer was the first consumer in the group that starts acting as the group leader and it decides as to how it will start distributing the load of reading data from the partitions okay so in the earlier situation, we saw that there was only one consumer and it was reading from all the partitions of the topic. Okay. Now, when consumers increased, the load is balanced and each of them are handling two partitions of the topic. Okay. Now, does it mean that we would keep on increasing consumers? So here we see a situation wherein the partitions are only three but we have five consumer groups, okay? And as you can see on the screen, the load is distributed. Each one consumer is able to actually handle one single partition at a time. Now, my question to you all is, what is consumer five going to do then? As part of Kafka uh, guarantees, a consumer can, uh, up one single partition can only be read from by one consumer. Why? Because say if partition three was being read both from consumer three and consumer four, what would happen? A single event will get processed twice, right? Consumer three will also process it. Consumer four will also process it, correct? So to avoid those kind of challenges, these are the set of boundaries that we have established as part of Kafka implementation that one consumer or rather one partition would can only be read by one consumer in a consumer group, okay? So this way, the maximum number of consumer instances that you can have in a consumer group can be only limited by the total number of partitions that you have, okay? Now, but we still see a consumer five here. Would the consumer five be doing any work right now? Yes or no? Yes no. or no in the chat? No. Yeah. But do you think there is any situation where we would want to have a separate consumer up and running? Because I have personally seen such situations where we have one ideal consumer sitting there just. Yes. Failover mechanism. Correct. So what happens is that we have a consumer which is just sitting in right now say there was no five consumer five okay what would have happened if consumer three went down what would have happened if consumer three went down either of the five remaining consumers sorry uh, imagine that five is not there it's only four consumers then in that case if consumer four would have went down either of the remaining consumers would have gotten the load of partition three, okay? Now, how that happens is first, the consumer four goes down, then there's a realignment which happens. So partition three will start pointing to consumer three. Now, then we work on consumer four, if the machine was down or if the pod was down, after say five minutes, the pod comes back again, right? And then again, partition three starts uh, getting utilized by consumer four itself. Right? But still, there was a lag of five minutes, right? Because there were two reassignments that happened right? when partition four went down and when it came up, right? So there are real time scenarios where we can't live with this five minute gap. Okay? That's where having a separate idle consumer helps. So when consumer four would have gone down, consumer five, which was idle, that would be the first preference for sharing the load for three, okay? So now, 
say you are there is a stocks uh, uh, application okay and these are like millions of events of stock events coming into you you have to read those events and those data have to get up, uh, uploaded in uh, computed and sent somewhere else right so those are the situations where five minutes can be detrimental right so those are the situations where you're okay to actually set up idle consumers as well how this will help is that that five minutes of downtime that you'll be able to gain up Okay, so this is how we uh, set up our default consumer. All of the complications that we talked about when it comes to writing, reading data, polling data, all of that is abstracted as part of consumer application, consumer uh, object here. Okay, so what we do is we set up the Kafka properties. We set up what is the input topic name that the consumer should subscribe to. Okay, and we set up what is the amount of the, what is duration in which we want to pull the events from consumers. Okay, so that you can pull the events and one by one in the third snippet, you see, we are reading the records one by one and we are doing the processing of writing it to somewhere. Else. Yes, please, there is a question. What are the different orchestrators apart from a container can be used and how are consumer workers integrated with Kafka? Did I answer this question? Is it clear now that in terms of orchestrators, I think that you're talking about who all can read data from Kafka. Yes, there are connectors that can read data from Kafka, right? They can by default read and then send the data somewhere. Then there is KSQL as well, Kafka streams, applications which can by default read data from Kafka. And how are these integrated with Kafka? For example, I create a Java application. I uh, import my Kafka library. I create a consumer group as I have created here. I create a, this third line you see, a consumer, string string consumer, the Kafka consumer uh, object that helps me create a Kafka consumer. And how do I tell it which topic to read from? That's where I set up consumer.subscribe. Okay. Is the question answered? Uh, I see. Oh, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Tell um, me. Uh, my question is I so you answered it well. Um, but uh, uh, my question is actually more towards um, uh, is there any integration where uh, Kafka can spin up the instances? So if it needs more instance of a certain worker, it can spin up more of it. Is there such things? Because uh, different topics will, um, the instances will require different uh, workers, right? I'm sorry, there was a background noise. The voice was not clear. Do you mind writing the I, question? Probably that will help. I yes, think Stella. it's related to auto-scaling. Um, I think what Shang was asking is that uh, with regards to the topic, if there's like more load, like how are we gonna scale? How does Kafka scale the, the instances? Oh. Oh. Is that correct? Okay. Huh? Yeah, I think it's really the auto scaling. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Now let's talk about scaling. Uh, so for scaling, if we started with a Kafka cluster, now the cluster that we saw had three brokers. If we need to scale it up, we will start putting more brokers into it. Okay. So that is for Kafka cluster scaling. Now coming to Kafka topics, whenever we create a Kafka topic, the first thing that we do is we sit with the, our architect. We understand what are the use cases for which we are building this application and what is the amount of data that could get written to this topic. Okay. Then when we have that understanding, we also get an understanding of who all are going to consume this data, right? So if there is only one application which is going to consume this app, uh, this data which is written into your topic, then you might want to set lower number of partitions, okay? But if there are multiple applications, so for example, say the topic that you are creating is user topic, and it could have every information related to a user. Now, 
if uh, there could be multiple applications which would want to re want to read data from this topic later right orders application user management application historical analysis etc right all those applications would want to read this data so when you know that this data would be read by multiple different consumers and those consumer groups could have multiple different instances as well you set up higher number of partitions for this data okay so that's how you scale out now say when you started your application you set up say 10 partitions for your kafka topic now after say six months or one year down the line you think that the load is increased and you want to increase the partitions so you can easily increase the number of partitions in your topic how what would happen is that there would be a realignment of data so whatever new data that starts coming in with the new hash so for example the earlier number of partitions was 10 then the by default had hash partitioner would use modular 10 right now if it is it, it has increased to 20 then it will use 20 as a partitioner logic and this way the kafka the order guarantee that we had in it, that would not be maintained but rest would be okay yeah? your load get it would get distributed and scaled did this answer auto scaling okay now when it comes to auto scaling yes it is allowed you'd have we have cli api cli commands which you can use for scaling up your brokers and topics yeah okay how are we running on time okay yeah Okay. Now we talked about consumer groups as well. So when it comes to groups, we always give them a group ID. So imagine that you have multiple Kubernetes pods coming up for that uh, uh, instances, then all those instances would have group ID same, and they would all go and get combined into a single group of movie ratings itself. Okay. Now let's talk about the Kafka ecosystem. Now say you have a rider service. Okay? We have uh, Uber, we have Ola. What happens is that there are multiple applications which are writing data into Kafka. Okay, and this is how a typical system design would look like for them. That they are all writing data into Kafka. Rider app is right, uh, writing. There are events coming about drivers. Uh, there are other applications and services. Say, for example, geolocation services. Then we have map services. All of them are they write. They are writing data to Kafka. And from Kafka, there are multiple consumers which are reading data from Kafka as well. So there could be multiple applications. So for example, you're showing dashboards, you have real time analytics being shown, right? Your driver is five minutes away. Those kind of situations, they are all handled through the consumer. So this is how a typical uh, ecosystem for with Kafka look like. Now, when it comes to any application, we see that either there are consumers and consumers could either be applications or these could be databases which are writing data to Kafka. And when it comes to your consumers, your consumers could be, say, applications which are reading from Kafka. These could be uh, file system services which are uh, storing data from Kafka, picking data from Kafka, doing some computation and storing data. Right? Now, because these use cases are so typical, there is an entire ecosystem which has gotten built around Kafka. So the in the middle we see is can we write multiple events with different schema to the same topic? Yeah. So this is a file. Okay. Now it is on to you. There is a question in the chat. Can we write multiple events with different schema to the same topic? <clears throat> now let me ask you this question. See, you are sitting in an inter interview and you have created a file. Okay. Now convert this question into a file can we write multiple events with different schema in the same file yes or no the answer would be yes correct because this is just a file now the amount of constraints that you want to put on the file is something that you would have to handle separately that this is my user's file i only want to put a user's data into it that this is my say orders file and i want, only want to write orders or data into it those constraints are something that you would have to put separately and those are put using schema registry okay and schema registry is part of the ecosystem which is built around kafka as we are talking about now in the middle you see we have a kafka cluster now what is kafka cluster there would be brokers there would be data written into it 
it is elastic and scalable because you can add and remove brokers, right? Then when it comes to reading data, there are uh, data sources and data sinks, right? So for example, there could be databases, there could be uh, applications like Spark, Flink applications, which are reading data and then computing. So for them, we have created Connect, okay? Then there are applications which need uh, computations as well, right? For that, we have created Kafka Streams application so that all the events that you're getting read, they come as events, uh, as streams, and we are able to run basic uh, streams, applications, stream uh, filters, aggregates, etc., on the Kafka events. Then on the top, we see is KSQL DB. And this is a DB specifically created for Kafka use cases. So because we have events being read and processed, and we would probably want to see their state as well, that's where Kafka DB comes into picture. So you can write your SQL type commands for the Kafka events on top of the Kafka uh, KSQL DB. Okay. Now Kafka Connect. What is a connect? So we understood that most of the use cases around Kafka are related to the source and sync. Correct. Now, because these use cases are so, so typical, we created a Kafka Connect ecosystem. So what would happen is that we have started providing source and sync connectors. So if you have a use case wherein you're reading from a JDBC system, okay, and putting this data into Kafka. In general, what would happen is that we would end up, say, creating an application. It could be written in Java or in Go, and we are reading data from the database, and say, through some select star query, and then putting it as event into Kafka, right? And there would be multiple applications which are doing that. So rather than creating separate applications, we have set up, we can set up a connect cluster and initiate a Kafka connector, which would do the same thing for you. So look at this slide. This is a humongous set of connectors that are provided by Kafka Connect. Okay, so if you look at it, pick up any one con uh, source connector from here and pick up any output uh, sync connector. So, for example, for my source connector, I pick up Cassandra. Okay, and for my sync connector, I pick up the Elasticsearch. Now you see data. If you if you use Kafka Connect, we'd be able to put up a connector to Cassandra, okay? And this connector will basically pull up all the events from that are getting written to Cassandra and write them into Kafka and show them, push them, upload them onto Elasticsearch. So this is what has this become. It is a typical ETL pipeline which we are seeing right now. Yeah. Similarly, say there is a Oracle database. You put up a connector there, okay? Connect. Uh, so you initiate connects connector and then data is whatever data is getting written into Oracle. All these new events are getting written into Kafka as well automatically and say these are getting uploaded into Redis, for example. Okay, so it, writing the entire end to end pipelines has become much simpler. Okay? Before connect came into picture. Uh, I'll give you an instance which I was working on. So previously, I was in a finance, uh, working in a finance domain where I had spent one and a half years building a product wherein we were essentially doing the same. There were applications which were writing transactional data. We were reading that transactional data. So there was a separate Java application which was reading data from the JDBC slaves, okay, the uh, my uh, the Oracle slave. And we had set up uh, Oracle Golden Gate. Uh, we had set up multiple applications to read data from Oracle. And then we were putting it into Kafka. And then we were getting this Kafka data out and pushing it onto Elasticsearch. And from Elasticsearch, there were other applications which were reading it. Now that took us one and a half years before Connect. Okay? Once we implemented Connect, the entire project, we were able to move it into this Connect cluster and rewrite in three months. So that is the huge amount of advantage that you get when we have Kafka working along with Connect. And how do you find all the connectors, which all connectors are supported? So you can go on to Confluent, Confluent Hub itself, and there you'd be able to see all the connectors which are by default provided. These are plug pluggable in the sense that once we have a Connect cluster set up, 
all you need to do is just use a REST API to initiate your connector. You need to provide what is the source. For example, if it is a source connector, then you only need to provide what is the source IP and then the what is the Kafka topic that it needs to get it into. Okay. So essentially, all your source connectors are what? They are implicitly, they are producers, Kafka producers, which are writing data into Kafka. And your sync connectors are what? They are reading data from Kafka and then pushing data somewhere else. Okay, this is a very basic elastic search sync connector. So what we have done, we have set the topic where it is reading from. Okay, and we have given it a name and the type of data uh, input format of the data, etc. It's as simple as that. Or uh, looking at it in programmatically. So we have set up the elastic search sync connector. Okay, we have given the URL of this elastic search cluster and the topic also where we want to uh, uh, read from. So this simple elastic search data is the topic. And then we are uploading into the doc name simple elastic search connector. Yeah. Then coming to schema registries, we had this question related to can we write all types of schema, right? So this is where schema registry comes into picture. So schema registry is a separate application which sits uh, other than Kafka uh, a cluster that we can set up. And then what would happen? You can have all your producers first uh, call schema registries API, register their events there, their schema there. So for example, you created a you object name user, okay? And it has say only user ID, user name, and user address, okay? So this is one particular schema. What we do is we call schema registries API and tell it that this is the schema that I have for user object, and it would give you an ID, okay? Now we use that ID to write all the data onto Kafka. Okay. Now when consumers are reading data from Kafka for, for this user topic, they would get this ID, they would call schema registry APIs and get the schema and use that to deserialize their objects and work on the object. Right. Now say six months down the line, you want to add a mobile number also to your user object. Okay, so you have now ID, you have name, you have address, you have mobile number. So essentially the schema has changed, correct? So your schema has evolved. Okay. So what would happen is the moment you start, you call the schema registry API, the schema would get registered by a separate ID. So say ID equal to two. Okay, so it is V2 version of your uh, schema and your, your, then we write data into Kafka. Okay, now when consumers are reading from Kafka, they would get the schema ideas too. So if the consumers are forward compatible, then in that case, they would be able to get the data from schema, from the schema registry on the latest schema and convert it accordingly and use the data, right? So this is where we have full control of what data we want to ensure that our consumers get from the Kafka topic. Right? There was a question earlier wherein, how do we ensure that the same schema gets written to a file? This is how you, you can ensure that only a certain type of schema gets written. Okay. So say if, if this, this was a user topic that you wanted to create and somebody randomly came and inserted some rubbish data into it, some spam data into it. Okay. But when this data will go to the consumers, the consumers only understand the schemas which are registered on the schema registry. Everything else will start going to the dead letter queue. Okay, so this way we have complete control on what data gets written. And also consumers can ensure that they have forward and backward compatibility. Yeah. Schema registry processes are external to the Kafka brokers. Okay, and there is a HA option also. See, for schema registry as well, you can have multiple instances, which will ensure that even if one instance goes down, you have other instance. So this is a uh, uh, representation of how ID gets registered onto the schema registry. And when the consumers on the right side have to read the data, they get the schema from the schema registry. They cache it in their local caches and use it for deserializing their objects. Okay, now coming to Kafka streams. Now, because all of the data which is written into Kafka, many are times there are requirements of real-time use cases. That's where Kafka streams come into picture, okay? So Kafka streams basically help in analyzing the data written into Kafka in terms of basic stream applications, 
okay and these are just functional java apis nothing more not, you don't need to set up any other application for kafka streams all you need to do is you need to import the libraries into your java application and you'd be able to use all the functionality that kafka streams provide and this is how a kafka stream application happens that you need to you can just as a consumer so essentially kafka streams are also built on top of so inside uh, there are the, the the concepts are same as that of a kafka consumer so all the concepts are related to your resiliency ha would still stay the same and when a kafka stream application runs it would basically read data from the topic work on do the computations and can write data into a separate topic so topic one it's reading from and topic two it's writing to okay now coming to ksql db ksql db is basically a database that we created to ensure that even when we are writing these streaming applications we always have state persistent okay so for example if anyone would have here would have worked on splink applications you would know that we uh, splink uses rocks db as an internal database right but when it comes to accessing that internal state it is programmatically very difficult right so that's where ksql db provides a user interface wherein just like how we have user interfaces for rdbms and mysql type databases we can just write select star from say the state and read the data from with the intermediate data also the um, file the data streams and tables that we had created as part of the processing we can get them from ksql db itself i'm quickly brushing through it so all the kind of uh, uh, computations that we do on top of simple sql applications for example joins aggregates pull pull and push queries udfs and connectors that can be written on top of ksql db itself matter of fact ksql db now completes the kafka ecosystem because kafka was only storage and ksql db is actually providing the compute part of it so whatever data is written on to kafka you can have a ksql db which can read the data written on to kafka do the computation and then send it back to kafka again on a separate topic okay and this way we create real time applications now essentially the basics of are you referring what if uh, there's a question let me read it what if part of user data is coming from multiple events and combine them to make a whole user data how does commit works there uh, <clears throat> okay so you are saying that there are multiple data and there are multiple events which are coming if these events are coming from multiple different uh, uh, producers and they are coming in multiple different topics right so that's where to combine all of this data so for example say um, there is user data coming in a separate topic which has address related information and there is a order data coming in a separate topic could topic name order now if you want to basically figure out for that order id equal to 1 and the user id equal to 10 what does user id 10 uh, what is the address for that user id you need to join correct and if you want to do it on the real time basis then we would have to implement, say, a KSQL uh, case streams application or Plink or application which would basically do the real time join of these two streams and then send out that user ID, the order ID one, the address of this data, uh, this user is this. Okay, so this way we do the amalgamation or join of streams at real time. Okay. Did I answer the entire question there? How does commit works there? Okay, since this is when it comes to commit, commit is done by the consumer itself, right? So the consumer says that, yes, I have read this set of events and you can pull, push it back. If you were writing your own commits, that's where you would you can do this commits yourself. But when it comes to case streams, Kafka streams, your commits are, your Kafka streams are essentially your Kafka produce uh, consumers itself, right? So they do these commits for you and they maintain the state as well in the case uh, equal DB itself. Okay. Moving on, this is how KSQL DB server looks like. There is an engine which uh, runs the queries and there is a REST API exposed, which we 
can access either through a k sql db cli api so there is a cli also uh, available where you can run the join queries the aggregator queries there or you can use the ui tool which is provided as part of the confluent control center so you see here on the tool you'd be able there's a select star from a particular topic query that has put there so we'd be able we are able to write such sql type queries directly using the on the topics itself using case equal db okay now let's quickly go through it i know we are running over time way over time uh, but i definitely want to cover the streaming data pipelines okay now that we we what is a streaming data pipeline a streaming data pipeline is where you have a source which is which is sending you events at real time okay and we would want that real events at the real time either say put into a sync okay or we would want some sort of dashboards created on top of this real time data okay and this real time data has several challenges millions of events might be coming in you would want to scale it out so for example if there is a uh, sale if there is a amazon say black friday sale right so the the consumers the producers they would need to be scaled out right then another challenge is that this needs to happen at real time so if you have if you're looking at amazon.com and there is a product and say there were uh, there, this was the last piece of that project product then uh, you would not want to have an experience that you have added it to your cart and when you're doing checkout then we are not able to run it out right because there is the product uh, there is no availability so it, all the information needs to be updated at real time so these are the challenges with streaming data pipelines, which were not there in batch data processing earlier. So 10 years back, most of the industry was focused on data lakes, uh, creating uh, data warehouses, big, huge data warehouses. Right? And most of our job was involved writing batch uh, pipelines or rather batch applications, which would mean that daily or hourly or weekly, there would be jobs which would be reading, say, several GBs and TBs of data and huge resources applied there. And they would look at this data, create an output and upload it somewhere, which next day somebody else would use, right? Now, they, that's where the industry trend changed and we went on to near real-time kind of or real-time stream data processing. For example, we started looking at what are the top orders in last five minutes, right? So that is kind of a real-time data processing application. But if we look at some uh, something like what is the transaction, there is a transaction which is happening from a fraud account, right? Then in that case, as a bank, so for example, if I have a bank, I'm writing an application and I don't want a fraud account to actually do a transaction, then that's where I would want the lowest latency, right? And the highest data security. There shouldn't be any data loss. I, every data event that's coming to my transaction system, I should have 100% control on it. And the moment the transaction comes, there should be a logic that I'm, I should be able to apply that this is a fraud account and I don't want this transaction to go through, right? So these are streaming data use cases, okay? And how Kafka comes into picture here? Because Kafka provides this clear uh, substitute of uh, writing data faster into files and reading from it without having producers and consumers having any knowledge of each other. Right, that's where Kafka provides best alternative, best uh, platform for streaming data pipelines. It is distributed. You can have your topic, uh, you can have multiple partitions for your topics, right? And it is highly scalable. You can keep adding more brokers when you need to scale out. It is resilient. How? Because even if say one broker goes down, the other broker would be able to continue serving you data, right? One thing is that, another thing is that, say if a consumer went down, right, the load gets shared across other available consumers. And when the consumer comes back, it starts reading from the data which it had last read, right? So this way is it provides resiliency, it provides persistence because unlike in-memory caches, all of this data, the topics that you are writing into Kafka, they are persisted in log files. Right? So this way, all of your data is always persistent. 
and, and the source and the target systems that you have, they are completely decoupled as well as you can have multiple consumers for a single topic itself, right? So this provides us highly resilient systems that are created on top of Kafka, okay? Now, when it comes to event processing, there could be multiple, um, say, apps which can write data into Kafka, your databases can write data into Kafka, and then there could be multiple producers. So, so for it, so essentially what we are looking at is that you have a set of producers which can keep on growing in your ecosystem or in your uh, uh, business. And then there are a set of consumers, these things, which can also keep on evolving as your business evolves. But at the same time, Kafka would be able to handle that amount of growth and would be able to scale as per need, okay? Now say there is a um, requirement that we want to figure out what are the top 10 active consumers and use, uh, what are the, what is the best seller product in last hour, right? These are the kind of streaming use cases, correct? So say you have a website that is hosted on top of an app or on a, uh, uh, or on a desktop as well, uh, website as well. And you want to figure out what are the top 10 customers. How would we figure it out? So there is, uh, there are events which are coming from the app. Okay, these events are order events, right? Now, these order events are going into your Kafka topic. You would want to know what are, with these order events, there would only be a user ID. You want to know the user's name as well. So for that, the data is written in D DBMS. You pull the data from DBMS. All of this data is onto Kafka, okay? Earlier, what we used to do is that we would basically have this data stored into S3 or SDFS, and then we would write a separate application, say a Java application, which is reading data and then converting or joining this data together, okay, and then showing it on top of our dashboard. This is how earlier applications were written. But now, with the entire ecosystem that Kafka provides, the KSQL DB, K streams, what we can easily do is we can actually have a streaming processing engine set up, which is working, reading data directly from Kafka and writing data into Kafka after processing, okay? And then we can have Kafka Connect, which is uploading this data onto the sink. Okay, now there are three real world data pipelines use cases. Uh, let me look at the question I got in a chat. If I consider RDBMS as my sourcing and extend it with Kafka, how will Kafka know the new transactions to the DB and make only change data available to the target sync? So very good question. That's where the connector comes into picture, okay? <clears throat> the connector utilizes CDC, change data capture, okay? So for example, you can set up Debezium as CDC. Uh, as CDC. If you have Oracle, then we also have uh, GD as CDC provider. Okay, these CDC have their own connector. So we have uh, we have MySQL connect uh, source connectors as part of Kafka. We have uh, Debezium connectors provided as part of Kafka. These CDC engines they look at what are the uh, data modification events uh, coming to the JDBC and read those events and convert them into uh, Kafka events and put them into Kafka with their schema. Yeah. This is how only the change data is captured and written onto Kafka. Now let's look at a typical ETL pipeline. A typical ETL pipeline looks like this. So there would be a, a source, say a MongoDB or a Postgres, uh, Postgres SQL, and you have to write data into Elasticsearch after doing some sort of processing. Now how can we use Kafka there? We can have say Debezium set up as a CDC, okay? So it what it would do is all the, new events that are getting written into your database, be it MongoDB or PostgreSQL, it would get extracted, all the new events or update events, those would get extracted, and we would use Kafka Connect, would use a connector, and that would start writing those changed events into Kafka, okay? Then what do we do? We set up our case streams application down there, which is reading these events from Kafka, and converting these events. So for example, we want to filter out some events, right? So those filters, those aggregates, those kind of processing is done in the stream, stream processing application. After stream processing, it writes 
the data back into another Kafka topic. From there, there is an elastic search connector that we implement and that's uploading data into elastic search, correct? So either you can write your own streaming uh, application or we can set up KSQL DB also as a slimmer design because KSQL DB would have embedded connectors also and you'd be able to just write select star kind of queries, join kind of queries on top of your uh, KSQL DB itself. Yeah. Then we have another use case that we have is materialized views. So sometimes what happens is that, so for example, you have a website which is data writing data into MySQL. And from MySQL, you have to basically create materialized views that you should want to, you would want to see what are the uh, top or total number of orders for a particular user, right? So that is a materialized view that we want to have. One simple implementation of doing that is, that we have, say, you have your source there. All this data is then written, then captured. All the events are captured through a Debezium CDC. Okay, there is a connector that we have, in, uh, we have there, and then all this data gets written into Kafka. There is a stream processing engine which is converting these streams, writing data again into another Kafka topic, and then there is a Redis sync connector which is implicitly just updating these events onto Redis. And then from Redis, you can do this indexed query. Yeah. Using KSQL DB, this design actually becomes slimmer. All of the materialized views that you wanted to create, instead of having Redis host them, you can have KSQL DB itself. Because the, on KSQL DB, you'd be able to directly see that uh, select star from say user DB where user ID equal to one. So these kind of queries are something that are implicitly provided by KSQL DB itself. Okay, the last and very uh, almost 80% of the use cases revolve around this is related to event driven microservices. So now say there are events which are coming to you and this is these events, say these are message or mailing events and these events you have to basically send email to the customers using a third party tool say sendgrid is your tool that you uh, that your company is using for sending events to on mails to customers so how would we implement that we are getting events these events we can start posting them to kafka okay so from kafka then later we create a streaming application we create a separate db which can store these events into the uh, intermediate state into the db and there could be multiple processing logic, side effects logic that if this is if this user is disabled, has disabled their meals, then we don't send out meals. Right? These kind of logic you can implement separately. And then the output is what gets sent to the, uh, the mailing uh, third party tool. Okay? You can make it even shorter or slimmer by implementing KSQL DB on top of it, all the e embedded uh, the connectors that we wanted to use, they are all embedded here. You'd be able to directly write your queries, do lookups on KSQL DB directly, okay? So this is how, uh, this is what we had planned today uh, around Kafka and all the real-time uh, events or use cases that are hosted on top of Kafka. This is it, I'm looking for questions. Please feel free to unmute yourself or write on the chat. Hey, Akash, uh, it was really an interesting um, presentations that you did and then you was sharing about like Kafka in general. But I was just like curious though, like maybe because mm -hmm. like few folks maybe just new to this whole data streaming or big data. Oh, yes. I think we have, but can I just ask my question first? <laughs> yeah, joking. So it's like, um, do you have any advice for people who actually just started um, to get to know um, data streaming or ML in general? You know where where should we uh, where where should we start? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, matter of fact, all the distributed environments and systems that you have, be it HDFS, be it Spark, be it Flink, they actually utilize the same concepts, and they go back to the Google Big Table One Hundred and One paper that was written a decade back, right? Which was then picked up by duck cutting and then HDFS was created, then Spark came into picture, MapReduce, Spark, Hive came into picture, uh, and then applications like 
Kafka also going into picture. So the concept is essentially the same. Okay. So for someone who's starting in distributed environments, I would first suggest look into that paper, in the Google's big table paper. The second thing would be Kafka in itself, it's very simple to understand once you start looking at it in terms of OS files. It's as simple files. So it becomes very simple to answer any question that one such instance we used also in our discussion today. And then on Confront, you would find there are several recorded sessions, in-depth recorded sessions for every single topic that you have on uh, that, uh, for example, case names have separate one, case equal DB has separate one, Kafka 101. And these are in-depth coverage of the architecture, the underlying principles of Kafka and very, in a very interesting and interactive way. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, let's go with the Brian questions. Why should I use Kafka over something like SQS or SNS? Yeah. So first of all, where is it? Now that you have gone through uh, the entire Kafka, let me ask you this question. Yeah. This question was from Brian. Do you want to answer this question yourself, Brian? Hello. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Hey. So I, I was I was just thinking because like either on the on the AWS side, you you don't really have to touch all the clusters yourself, right? Um. Hmm. So it seems to me it, it just looks to me that Kafka is very um. You have to set up clusters, then and then you basically have more administrate. You have more work for yourself, right? So Hi. I was just wondering, like how, like I I know I know it says that um, uh, in general the 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 logic is that Kafka is better. It has higher throughput than SQS slash SNS. But I'm not too sure, yes. like why why we need all that extra throughput and all that stuff. I think let me answer your question uh, in another way. What is the brand shoes uh, that you like? What, what is the brand that you like? Nike, Adidas? Oh, I, Which I shoes? Guess I like. <laughs> Nike, right? Why <laughs> Nike? Why don't go to a store anywhere? Like you can find shoes anywhere, right? Yeah, I like um because they have a team specifically working on the challenges that people face when it comes to wearing shoes, right? Their hundred percent attention is towards that. What are the kind of bugs that you can get when you implement it? What is the amount of throughput that you would need? Why is it that you need a faster read, right? Kafka implements zero network. You understand that? Zero copy uh, uh, fundamentals. The data which is written from file to file, it is very, very file writing operations are the costliest applications, right? But those operations are also optimized in Kafka because they have put in that amount of effort in ensuring that they don't write it at, at application level itself. Remember the seven layers of networking, OS layers of networking, right? So when Kafka writes data from one place to another, it actually utilizes zero copying. So it does not even move up out of the kernel itself, all of this data gets written socket to socket. How brilliant is that, right? So because of these concepts, the entire focus for OSS Kafka, open source, uh, open software, source software Kafka is on ensuring that it serves the kind of use cases which require the consumers and producers to scale, to uh, basically handle large volumes, right? and without any data drop. Because if I give you this interview question that you have to, you, there is an application which is writing da data, you have to create a middleware, which has to get this data persisted, create HA, create replication, have persistency, and then uh, serve to its consumer as well, right? Kafka has basically ensured that there is no network, though no data loss at any place. And there are configurations set in place how you can tune it. If you want, if you're okay with data loss, if you want faster writes, then you can tune it accordingly. If you want that, no, I don't, I can't bear a single event drop. Those amount of efforts have actually gone into setting up this framework. And that's where the brilliance of OSS Kafka comes into picture, right? 
And if we talk about what are the different uh, versions of Kafka already available, SQS, SNS, Confluent Kafka, there are versions from Azure as well, right? Everybody has their own versions. Why? They had to come up with it because they needed these publisher subscribe kind of mechanisms. Everybody needed them. That, that's a very, very, very typical use case, industry use case. So you figure out that, um, that a matter of fact, when it comes to Amazon as well, we have a very tight integration with uh, Amazon. Uh, Confront and Kafka work very together. Confront and Amazon work very together, uh, very closely. And the reason for that is there are applications which are built on top of AWS, which would need a higher resiliency, higher data security consistency, and that's where they go for Kafka. But if there are other projects where they are okay with that, they are okay with data loss, they are okay with throughput, lesser throughput, they are okay with higher latency, then why not utilize the ones that they already provide implicitly? Right. Okay. Did I answer your question? Yeah, uh, you answered my question. Yeah, for oh, stuff like that, it's good. That's cool. Yeah. Thanks. We can actually uh, continue with our discussion. Uh, I have my I had my LinkedIn ID in the slide. If you were not able to capture it, search for Ankit Chahan. Okay, and uh, I'd be happy to answer your questions. I have a couple of more questions. Yeah. Okay. In context of AWS architecture, would you suggest utilizing Amazon MFK or Kafka cluster deployed on EC2? Could you please elaborate on key differences between these two options? I think we have covered it. Uh, did that answer your question, um, RL? Okay, so I think there is another question as well before that. Uh, it's by Emmanuel. So it's about, um, can I use case SQL DB to make five independent tables in Azure SQL to combine required data based on a new a new case? and then send the data in real time based on transaction happening on the DB. Yes, yes, you can. Because what we are talking about again here is databases, okay? And you can read from databases using the connect connectors. All of these, what the connectors do is that all of the events coming into your GDBC is then converted into Kafka events, which are then used by KSQL. So then there you can write your join queries, your aggregated queries, and write the data back into a Kafka topic. And from that output topic, you can again have a sync JDBC connector, which can start writing to your JDBC again. Emmanuel, did this answer your question? Yes, good, okay. Um, okay, I think all the questions are answered. And I, I had fun uh, during this discussion. Thank you guys for making it so interactive and coming in alive. This this was the was one of the most alive sessions that I had. I had fun uh, delivering it, and I hope you guys were also able to get value out of it. Definitely, yeah. Thank you, Alkesh. Definitely, yes. Uh, so we have more sessions. We can have more in-depth use case specific use, uh, sessions. Um, so Stella, you can get in touch at, uh, with Anna and we do conduct many more deep sessions, uh, hands-on sessions as well. Matter of fact, two weeks back, we had a very, very interactive workshop uh, where we did actual coding as well. So happy to do that. Amazing, thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Bye. 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 Thank Bye, you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.